So how does a chemist routinely look at matter at the molecular and atomic level? Well, it turns out we can infer a great deal about what's going on in an atom by simply shining light on the subject. We have a wonderful predictive periodic table that has a very recognizable and iconic form. It was built intuitively by organizing the elements by their relative atomic mass measurements and then reorganizing them into groups based on their common reactivity. We also can look at an atom's reactivity, categorize the at atomic ions, cationic and anionic charge, and look at the atom's placement on the periodic table relative to the noble gases. We see that atoms tend to form atomic ions that have as many electrons as the noble gases they are closest to on the table. A suspicion grows in the minds of scientists that there must be a link between the reactivity of atoms and their electronic structure. So why does this periodic table take the form it does? And what is it about the atoms wanting to become noble? Surprisingly, the key to understanding the nature of the periodic table was in figuring out a 25-year-old problem that had yet to be resolved involving the strange interaction of elements and light. Scientists for a very long time have been intrigued by matter's interaction with light. This hasn't changed. <laughs> My specialty in the field of chemistry is in optical spectroscopy, which is simply the study of the absorption and emission of light by matter. How a material interacts with light is unique and is as distinctive as the fingerprint of a person. The light interaction is exclusive to the matter and is, in effect, matter's fingerprint, helping us identify the kind of matter and even the amount of matter. Because light is so very small, the way the light interacts with the matter is at the equally small atomic level. Thus, the results of spectroscopic measurements are reflections or pictures of what is happening at this atomic microscopic scale. We first need to restate a very important idea about the nature of light. Light is energy. The color of the light is a measurement of the amount of energy a photon of the light carries with it. From the electromagnetic spectrum, we know that for visible light, the bluer the light, the more energy it represents. Now what did we mean by absorption and emission of light in my definition of optical spectroscopy? Well, these two terms describe two of the fundamental measurements we can make when studying something spectroscopically. First, let's look at an absorption measurement. An absorption measurement is one in which uh, the matter, sitting all innocent and unknowing, is bombarded with light, or as you now know, we are bombarding it with a bunch of energy. Now the matter will absorb certain parts of the light energy that strike it, not others. The process is demonstrated in this slide. We first put in a sample that doesn't have the matter in it. This is our control or blank, and the light that passes through it is reflected off of a diffraction grating, creating a rainbow of color that can be picked up on a detector. Now you've probably seen this diffraction effect when you look at the surface of a DVD or CD disc and see the rainbow of color that comes off its surface. A similar effect can be obtained with the prism too, but they're hard to manipulate and a bit more unwieldy and expensive to use. So we take this picture of this rainbow that comes out of the spectrometer with something akin to the camera in our smartphones. We then put the matter we want to study into the sample holder redo the experiment, and produce a different rainbow of color. This difference exists because some of the colors are absorbed by the matter. The difference in the two pictures is what we use to produce an absorbance versus color plot. Now, since we know the type of light and intensity of light that comes out the other side through the control, it's a relatively simple thing to measure what's missing in the picture when the sample with the matter in it is put in its place. Now, with a great deal of accuracy, we can define the light energy missing in the matter picture 
relative to the control and thus surmise the colors absorbed by the matter. And we then plot how much light was absorbed of a certain color of light versus the energy of that color of light and produce a spectrum. Multiple plots are called spectra, the plural of spectrum. Now this spectrum is the fingerprint we're looking for and is unique to the type of matter in the sample. And we get a bonus. The height and scale of the absorbance on the y-axis gives us a very precise way to quantify the amount of matter in the sample. Absorption measurements are a handy method of quantifying the amount of matter as well as what type of matter it is. Let's look at the second important process that spectroscopists like to measure, an emission process. Now let's begin by showing a diagram of both the absorption and emission processes. In effect, a low energy form of matter called the ground state absorbs energy in an absorption process and is now in what we call an excited state. Now comes a Dr. Striplinism. No one can be excited forever. Everything tends to get back to the lowest energy state that it can eventually. Now what this means in this scenario is that this excited piece of matter will eventually release the energy and get back to its happy low energy ground state. Now this can happen in a variety of ways, but one of the simplest things it can do is to release the energy on one big chunk in the form of light energy. Now the light that's released is called emitted light and the act of measuring this light energy is called an emission measurement. So in this measurement, we excite the matter utilizing the light we know the matter will absorb. We can also excite the molecule by hitting it with a burst of electric charge. Now this is what happens when we observe light from LEDs or fluorescent lights or neon signs. The excited matter, in its effort to get back to the low energy ground state, gets rid of the energy in the form of light. Now this emitted light is focused and reflected off a diffraction grating again, and we take a snapshot of the rainbow of color it produces. The spectrum, in this case, is called an emission spectrum and consists of a plot of the intensity of the light that was emitted versus the color or energy of the light emitted. As before, this plot will be unique to the kind of matter and the amount of matter present in the sample. One of the great founders of spectroscopy was the Swedish uh, scientist Anders Johannes Angström, and we've spoken of him already. We named a length unit, an atomic size length unit after him, the Angström, which is equivalent to 10 to the minus 10th meters. Well, in the 1860s, he built one of the first emission spectrometers and began looking at emitted light from a wide variety of light sources. Now, two of these are of special note. One was the study of light produced by the sun and the stars in the sky. He produced a huge set of data with his telescopes consisting of emission spectra from the light emitted by individual stars. And he also produced an emission spectrum of excited hydrogen gas and noticed that the emission fingerprint of hydrogen showed up in the emission spectra he obtained from the light of our sun and stars. So he proved that hydrogen was an important element in the makeup of the stars. And this is a huge deal in cosmology. Now what was also amazing to the scientists of the day was that hydrogen gas produced a unique and simple looking spectrum. If you look at the color spectrum closely, instead of a wash of color like a rainbow, it only emits specific, highly monochromatic colors known as spectrum lines. And looking at the emission spectrum of hydrogen shown in this slide, it's easy to see where that name came from. Line spectra were produced for a great many of the atomic gases, especially the diatomic and noble gases. And each spectrum was unique for each of the elements that were studied. Looking even more closely at the hydrogen spectrum, it turns out that these lines are just the ones a human can see in the visible region of the electromagnetic spectrum. There are a great many lines in the ultraviolet UV region to the left of the violet or purple lines on the spectrum, and in the infrared IR region to the right of the red line that humans can't even see. So more sophisticated light detection methods would later find these emitted lines in the spectrum of hydrogen. 
Now the visible set of lines shown in this slide would eventually be called the Balmer series of lines named after the Swiss mathematical physicist Johann Balmer, who at the age of 60 in 1885 began to study Angstrom's hydrogen line spectra almost 25 years after Angstrom produced them. Balmer discovered a pattern to the lines and he derived a rather simple formula for calculating all the colors that would be absorbed or emitted by the hydrogen, even the UV and IR ones that hadn't been seen yet. It would take another 25 years before this magical equation and the unique line spectra produced by hydrogen could be explained. That's where we're going next. We want to be able to explain the nature of the unique line spectra of hydrogen and the other elements. So here we are in the year 1913. Rutherford has given us the nuclear theory of the atom with a picture of the positively charged center with the electrons flying around the nucleus. We know atoms interact with light and emit light in very specific ways and we have a beautiful mathematical connection helping us quantify light and its energy for hydrogen. We see that atoms can absorb and emit only specific bits or quanta of light energies as shown in our absorption and emission spectra. So all we need now is a young scientist who can put it all together and give us a more refined picture of the atom. Hopefully they will lead us to what we ultimately want, the underlying reason why there is a periodic arrangement of the elements in the periodic table. That brilliant scientist will be Niels Bohr, and we'll learn more about him in an upcoming lecture. See you soon.